Welcome, everybody. Um, so this is our talk, Boombox, audio workflows inspired by constraints. And um, it's just going to go through some workflows that we have each developed in our, uh, our different careers. And mm -hmm. uh, let's, uh, let's get stuck into it. This cool. is Jeff Van Dyke, Hello. Alexander Hume. Hello. Um, oh, why, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I haven't even done anything yet. <laughs> Uh, just going to do a quick survey of the room uh, of everybody here. Uh, who here is sort of a beginner audio person? Got some beginners here. Yep, mm -hmm. cool. Welcome. Uh, is there some more advanced audio folk here? Oh, oh cool. cool. Okay, hello. And is there anybody here who's really uh, isn't really in the audio field? Okay, interesting. <laughs> okay, the door's over there. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to be mean. Um, <laughs> yes, so we're going to be um, talking about some workflows, some tricks and tips that we've developed over the years. And uh, so we're going to just jump into that. Uh, oh, actually, before we do that, I'm going to just say we're going to be here all week uh, at uh, GCAP and PAX. So if you see us, feel free to come up to us and talk to us and say hello and ask questions about whatever we talk about now or what, what have you, because we love talking about uh, audio. Yeah, absolutely. If I've got any voice left, I'm happy to talk to you about it. <laughs> um, so now, Jeff, please tell us about your, yourself, your illustrious career. Uh, okay. No, wait, actually, that's the wrong one. You ah! Actually, you should tell us about yourself. Oh. <laughs> what a, uh, I happen to have this ready. Um, so my name is Xander Hume. I'm a game audio designer. And I say that because I do music and sound effects and implementation. So a small indie project will come to me, and I'll handle all of their audio needs, anything you hear in the game, I'll take care of. Um, I've mostly worked in mobile games, as you can see a bunch of app icons there. Um, but I'm now just moving into consoles, which is very exciting. And I'll tell you all about it when the NDA expires. Hmm. Um, so Jeff, please, tell us about what you do. Sure. Uh, OK, well, uh, I'm a game composer, sound designer, and audio director. I've been doing it for a really long time, since the early 90s, 92 specifically. Used to work at Electronic Arts in Vancouver. Uh, one of the first games I worked on was Skitchen on the Mega Drive. Um, worked on the very first FIFA. <laughs> uh, worked on uh, the first NHL hockey on the PC. Uh, Need for Speed 1 and 2. Um, yeah, like lots of old stuff at EA. Uh, when I moved to Australia in the 2000s, I started working on the Total War series and worked on lots of Total War. Uh, and then this de decade, more recently, I worked on a game called a Alien Isolation, uh, which was probably the, one of the bigger games I worked on and the um, biggest team I've ever managed. Um, and since then, I've decided to go indie because I much prefer working with smaller teams and uh, just being a lot more sort of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, yeah, yeah, so... Right. Well, without any further ado, let's, uh, let's get started, shall we? Okay. So, um, so, Jeff, do you have any workflows handy? Uh, <laughs> That uh, for getting started on a project, for sort of paving the way and making things run more smoothly. Yes, I do. Here's one I've prepared earlier. Uh, basically, uh, one thing that I really like getting started with, uh, and this is look really quite straightforward, quite basic, but it's still really important, is getting a really strong uh, music brief uh, from the developer that I'm working with. And um, so I worked on this game called Submerged uh, by Uppercut Games. Uh, and uh, Ed Orman, their uh, designer, sent me this brief when he asked me to uh, work on the game. And it was the best brief I've ever received. It was just so clear and concise, and I knew exactly what they wanted. And this is, this is actually more for the non-audio folks uh, communicating to audio people that uh, this is a great way to uh, lay it out. Um, obviously, this document says uh, there were, it defined the emotional goals of the game, the gameplay, and the thing that really sort of just was straight to the point was the touchstones, uh, which says uh, make the music simple, natural, serene, and a bit mournful. Uh, you, they suggested using piano and string quartet. Um, and they sent me some uh, useful links of reference, um, and then a list of cues that they were expecting. And uh, look, the process went so smoothly. It was so clear what they wanted. Um, and. Uh, yeah, so like I, I'll, what I'll do is I'll just show you what, what came of that. Uh, feel free to, thank you. So this is music from Submerged.
Yeah, so that's what that turned out like. Mm. And, and now that was the first piece that you sent them, wasn't it? It was. It was, like, it was really in, I was really inspired by mm -hmm. that video that they sent me. And um, it was the first thing that I did, uh, wrote and I sent to them. They are like, that's perfect. And I went, cool. And it was, you know, happiness was abundant. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Mm. So um, we call that part of a, a workflow now because that's like... That's practically a template you give to developers. Yeah, well, yeah like. pretty much. That's what I really mm. like. Um, really now, of course, game. on that particular game, all I did was the music. Uh, but Xander, you know, like, obviously, uh, we get asked to do music and sound effects and dialogue. And, you know, what do you use as a part of your workflow to help sort of track all that? Well, I might happen to have a spreadsheet. <laughs> um, I love spreadsheets. We love spreadsheets. We do. Um, <laughs> this and, uh, and this is one I've been working on for a long time. I sort of iterate... Uh, polishing it up a little bit with each project. Um, and basically, it's just full of a bunch of uh, conditional formatting and data validation, um, which are the two things. And if you don't want to Google those, I think you can just Google like Google Slides, tips and tricks or whatever. And, and really, those two things will help immensely. So we've got here basically like a count of the status and this little drop down menus. And you can see what the name of it is, what the type of it is, what the priority is, who's working on it. So here on this project, I had a team, and I had a list of you know whose sound that was the responsibility of making that. Um, and then also, there's notes for the developer, and notes for implementation, and notes from the developer and stuff, all, all in here. Right, and you, you, this is actually a Google sheet, so that way it's really convenient because everybody can access it. And uh, it's more convenient than, say, an Excel doc, because Excel docs, you have to kind of worry about version control and all that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah, and, and, and I can't stress enough how I, I will use this every day. Mm -hmm. Every day that I work on that game, I will use this spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And that's because it's great for the planning, the budgeting. So after you scope the game and you spot the game, you figure out roughly how many sounds and things you need and what, surfaces, uh, what, um, what uh, purposes mm -hmm. those, those sounds need to serve. You can map this out, and it helps you estimate your costs, helps you estimate cost to the client, um, helps you keep track of the progress during, uh, you know, as you're going along, and make sure the scope of the game is going. And and it's it's just so handy on so many levels. Mm -hmm. And also, as we were saying, for that communication with the developer, if you mm -hmm. you know share it online. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But let's move on to the real meat and potatoes. Uh, I want to hear about making assets. Okay. So Jeff, please, would you please tell us about your composing process? My composing process. Okay. So uh, this. Uh, we're going to just switch gears here. In fact, the whole talk, we just keep switching gears into different parts of things here. So, uh, yes, my favorite part here, um, creative uh, process and workflow. So um, each project, I tend to use a different approach to just keep things fresh because I'm writing so much music. I find that actually doing something like changing which DAW I'm using to help kindle some fresh ideas. So I'll switch from, I tend to use Reaper at the moment, but sometimes I'll switch over to using uh, logic or uh, even reason or something like that. And I find that the different DAWs kind of uh, give me a breath of fresh air, fresh inspiration. It's a little bit like changing the furniture in the studio to give you a new perspective and, you know, uh, get uh, new ideas. I tend to start with an appropriate sound, piano and strings, uh, or a synth, or, you know, if it's uh, uh, something like Tronic, I'll, I'll use, you know, start with drums or something like that. And uh, I'll tend to improvise over a gameplay video uh, or a video of gameplay for about 20 minutes. Uh, and I tend to throw out about 19 and a half minutes of that jam and find these, looking for these little uh, gems, you know, little moments of inspiration that come out of the ether. Uh, it could be as simple as something like three notes. Um, yeah, so uh, then uh, what I do is uh, I take the piano part uh, and I tend to explode it across the orchestra. Um, and, and I mix as I go. I tend to try and always use final-ish kind of sounds, even right from the very beginning, because um, I like uh, getting to the end of the composing process and having mostly a, fu a finished mix right at that moment. Uh, so here's an example of the sort of uh, breaking things down. So this is... Uh, uh, one of the piano parts, um, and you can see it's segmented of different parts of a previous jam. And um, from this, I'll take this and I've uh, split it over to the string section. 
and that's pretty much what the piano part was playing, so it's, that's almost ver verbatim there. Uh, but now I'll, I'll just add uh, some brass, and in this case I'm kind of emphasizing parts of that riff, uh, but it's not copying it exactly. Um, obviously, layers of uh, percussion, quite like the drums. Uh, a bit of drum machine. In this case, this, this song was from a game called Forts, which is a stylistically is a combination of uh, sort of orchestral, military kind of music, but also with synth added to it, uh, just, just to make it sound kind of more fun and less serious, you know? So there's some synth tracks here. And then this is everything together. Uh, I'll mute the piano track. Right. Cool. So um, you could, could you also tell us about how you do your articulations when it comes to those yep. string and brass parts and stuff? Why, yes, I can. Um, so uh, obviously, um, with orchestral stuff, it's really important to use your articulations of the different instruments, use, them, use as much of them as possible. Uh, the thing is, is um, I hate key switches. I don't know, if, does anybody else hate key switches? Yeah, key switches suck, right? If you know if you don't know what I'm talking about there, that's basically you can imagine you got the key you got the keyboard, uh, you've got say a string sound, and uh, it's a, it's a sustained kind of sound. If you push uh, the series of keys down at the bottom, which don't make sound, but they actually switch the keyboard or the strings from being sustained to staccato or pizzicato or tremolo, the different articulations. Anyways, it's a pain in the ass because each each library is different, each instrument is different, and uh, yeah, so I hate them. Uh, but, uh, so I, I, I thought I came up with this idea, uh, and I'll show it to you, um, uh, but basically this is how I, how I go about it. Um, and that is, so this is uh, Reaper, so on the right there, that's a contact, and all of the different, all of the different articulations are on different MIDI channels, right? So I've just played, uh, this simple little melody here on a, on a sustained um, patch. And um, so that's all on MIDI channel one. Uh, this is Reaper and I've, I've set up shortcuts to change the MIDI channel just at the, uh, just above the notes there. You can see it says sustain, sordino, tremolo, trill, all these different articulations. So I'm gonna just highlight them all and uh, set them to staccato by just hitting them, setting them to channel seven. And now it's all staccato. Nice and easy, no key switches. And then if you want to combine your articulations, I just, in this case, highlighted the longer notes, set them back to channel one, and now I've got a combination of. And I find that way easier than key switches. And um, color-coded too. Yeah, well. and they're color-coded. So we start to learn, like, oh, that color is that articulation, and that color is that articulation. So it's really clean. Uh, and then the other thing is, is that I've used this strategy across all of the instruments for the orchestra. So what I'm doing here is I'm copying what I played, putting it onto the French horns, which are, I've configured the exact same way. All I'm doing here is transposing it up an octave of what I've already played. And we get, both are using the same articulations and I've now done that across the woodwinds and across you know, other, other instruments and stuff. And I just find it's a huge uh, time saver and just uh, makes it much easier. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose some software has like articulation management type stuff. You know, I think Cubase has it. I haven't never really used it and I think maybe Logic has it, but this works across multiple DAWs and is independent of libraries and stuff like that. It's up to you what articulation is on which channel. So I just find that a really uh, handy way to go about it. Cool. Yeah. So Xander, um, now. Your process is quite different to my process, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is actually, because um, as you were saying, I think one of, the, one of the key things you were saying is that you mix as you go along, mm. whereas my, my process is very segmented. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and I actually tend to prefer having that isolated thought process for each part of it. So, so I start with playing around on ukulele or piano or voice to get a harmonic structure, because uh, chords, I feel like, are, are really the most important thing for me uh, in, de in de determining like where music is going and, and, and that sort of thing. And the melody sort of comes secondary. And then once I've got that, I'll map it out in into Sibelius and sheet music. And, uh, and from there, I'll export the uh, MIDI over into Reaper. And then in Reaper, I'll uh, do all my articulations and virtual instruments. And then I'll bounce out the stems into <laughs> Pro Tools, uh, in which I'll mix everything. Which is partly because I'm more comfortable in Pro Tools for mixing, but partly because it, does a, it makes a clean break between this composing headspace and the mixing headspace, which is just a totally different job. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I feel like it, it makes me, you know, not go back and go, oh, I just want to adjust the articulation of this or the velocity of that node or, mm. you know, helps me just go, no, I'm just mixing this. And if I really do need to make a change, I can go back into Reaper, make the change, export the stems, drop it into Pro Tools, all of the mixing automation is already there, so it works fine. Um, so let's just hear that process. So this is the uh, MIDI in Sibelius, the track I did for a game called Pandora's Books. So, you know, sounds like MIDI. And the handy thing actually is that Sibelius knows these general rules about music, like what the strong beats of the bar are and that sort of thing. So when you export the MIDI out of it, it's got already some finesse in terms of velocity and stuff. So from there I massage it, mix around my velocities and timings, articulations. And this is the in Reaper. And then this is everything mixed together. Again. So That's I think cool. it's evident, evident that we both like brass a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so now we've talked a bit about our musical work workflows. Uh, what about sound design? What can we show them? Oh, well, I, I do have some more um, hands-on tips for sound design stuff. Okay. Um, so my general workflow for that is that I'll assess what the purpose of the sound is and whether it needs to be literal or just like a, a representative sound or, or something, right? And then I'll set about trying to see if I can record as many elements of that as possible. Uh, and anything else I can't record, I'll make up with library sounds and synthesis, and then I'll layer and blend it all together. So uh, here's some little videos of me doing uh, Foley recordings. Now, Xander, what is that thing? <laughs> uh, it's just your garden variety BDSM paddle. Ah, uh, right? I knew it. Um, where, where did you get it from? Um, oh, um, <laughs> a Christian op shop. <laughs> um, they said, you're that sound guy, aren't you? I've got, you come around the back with me for a minute here? <laughs> yeah. They wouldn't let me uh, take it out in broad daylight, so I had to stuff it down my pants. <laughs> Um, anyway, <laughs> that aside, um, uh, so, so here is uh, my Pro Tools session with all those recordings in. Um, we'll see after. So this is a game called Bounce House I worked on. And the bouncing sound is pretty core sound. And stuff. So I need to think about what I wanted to um, achieve with the bouncing, right? So um, you'll see here in this session, I've, I've muted all but one on each of these channels so we can hear what the different layers are. And the last two sounds at the end, we're hearing everything laid together. So um, if you're interested, from top to bottom, that's slamming my hand against the end of a pool tube with a pitch bend, uh, stretching a deflated balloon, hitting an inflated balloon, uh, stretching a deflated balloon at half speed, softly hitting an exercise ball, uh, quite a bit of white noise with a filter sweep going up it, uh, contact mic recording of rubbing my finger on a fridge, and then a squeaky toy. And uh, the only one of those that's a, a library sound was a squeaky toy, actually. Um, so let's hear each of those. And so I had um, a number of variations there. Um, 
Yeah, that's cool. I like how, um, like, obviously the bouncing sound is consistent from, from one variant to the other, but you've got this sort of squeaky toy on top that's quite different from variant to variant, so that mm. it, it serves the purpose of being both uh, consistent mm. and, and there's variety at the same time. Yeah, well, I, I, um, when I've got these sounds like this one, where it needs a lot of different variations because you're bouncing all the time, and you want it to always sound consistently like, oh, yeah, that's the bounce sound, mm. but you also want to have this um, idea you're not hearing a recording over mm. and over again. Mm. Um, so that's why I've got so many variations. But, yeah, I've got the main core sounds have very little variation, and they're very similar, and that means that the rhythm and the timing and the way it sits with the animation is consistent. But then with some of those sort of flourish sounds on top, they can, yeah, they can be a bit more varied and, and different, mm. and it doesn't spoil the consistency of the effect. Yep. Yeah. Cool. And do you have some other sort of uh, tricks that you, uh, that you use? Uh, one or two. <laughs> uh, uh, so these are my, a couple of my favorite things for, for sound design work, um, and, and these have uh, really just revolution, revolutionized my workflow. Um, so this is a trick I learned from Matthew Martinson, and it's a uh, triple compression chain. And, and the way that it works, I'll just bring this up here. So this is one of the bounce layers. And, and what I, I've got is three, pro, uh, three compressors on, uh, in series on the, this one track, right? Um, and the first one I set to a threshold and ratio and a, a slow attack and a slow lease, say like 10 milliseconds in and 100 out or something, or 50 out. And then I, I tweak that so that it's taking off about one or two decibels, right? And then the next one, I duplicate this. So it's got the same threshold. I increase the attack. I increase the release. So now it's, sorry, I decrease them both. So they're both faster. So now we've got like five milliseconds in, you know, 20 milliseconds out or something. And then I duplicate that again. And the third one has like less than a millisecond in, 10 milliseconds out. And uh, the effect you get here is they're, they're all taking off just one or two decibels, right? But collectively, first the transient pops up, the last plugin is the fastest, right? It activates first. Then the slightly slower one kicks in, which pushes the threshold above what the first one was kicking in. So what you get is like the first one activates first, but then releases first, allowing the others to take over. And it creates this quite smooth effect. And it actually is a very transparent way of compressing a sound down without spoiling the character of it. Mm. It's, it's, um, it's really interesting because, you know, when you we spend a lot of money on on special plugins that have, you know, mocked up to be exactly the same circuitry as, as, you know, this famous hardware compressor. And you can really hear when you punch it that it, you know, it, the mm. way it cuts into it is really colored. You know, it's got a really cool sound to it. But this is just really transparent. It's really mm. doesn't change the flavor. And it helps you get something nice and loud. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So, yeah, it helps me, especially on mobile games, you just can't afford to have big dynamics. So mm. this really helps me squash stuff down without destroying the character of it. That's cool. Mm. And um, the other thing uh, is something I learned from a mastering engineer. And this uh, I found really interesting. Uh, so in Pro Tools, instead of, instead of bouncing directly out of Pro Tools into a file, what I do is I set up a, a preprint bus and then a print track. So the preprint uh, auxiliary there is going to have every other track goes to it, right? And it accepts that, that bus. And now that's got my mastering chain on it. And at the end of the mastering chain, there's this limiter. And here I'm just tickling it and uh, just basically trying to bring it up to volume without really doing any sort of heavy limiting or anything. So then what I do is I take the output of that track down to negative 1, because you don't want to be clipping above uh, negative 1 on some things like MP3 and so on. Um, so it's generally safe to try and keep below that. And then I route that into this bottom track, hit record, play it in. It prints it out. So now that I've got this down here, I can look at the waveforms that I'm going to be exporting. I can zoom right in and then zoom in like uh, vertically heaps, right? And see if there's any tiny deviation from silence. Come in, top and tail it incredibly precisely, decide whether I want to you know, uh, chop off a bit of the tail, uh, sorry, the, the top or not, and that sort of thing. And then you highlight your clip, press uh, Alt-Shift-3, it... Uh, consolidates the clip, so it renders it into a new clip. And here's the, the cool part, is that if you name the track something, every, every uh, clip that you consolidate along that track gets named track name plus a number. So here, I've got you know, big bounce, 
and then I can go do top and tail real quickly, render, 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 render. They're already named big bounce one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Then you highlight them here, shows up in the clip view, you can export them. And uh, no matter how you're exporting them from here, uh, so even if you're exporting to like a lower bit depth or something, Pro Tools will dither it for you and everything. So it's, it's, it's you know, safe. You don't have to worry about artifacting or weird stuff there. Um, anyway, that, that's enough uh, yeah. rabbiting on that's really uh, cool. by me about this stuff. But I'd like to hear if, if you've got any particular sound effects tips, Jeff. Yeah, sure, I do. Um, so I worked on this game called Hand of Fate 2. And in Hand of Fate 2, there are a lot of stings that occur in the game uh, when, uh, when a card is shown to you. Uh, and because uh, I had, there were so many of them, they needed to be r related to each other. And so I, I like uh, working on them all in one giant project file uh, in Reaper. So uh, here's my process. I might uh, actually try and turn on the, uh, the laser pointer, um, if, I, if that's going to actually help me. Hold on. I think you have to turn off the laser pointer. Oh, yes, I must do that. There we go. Yeah. OK, so what I've got here uh, on the, the left is my um, uh, these are folder tracks, and so these uh, tracks contain other tracks in them, uh, in this case with the media for the sound effects. Um, so uh, each folder is a different sound effect, uh, moving along here. Uh, and then um, along the top, uh, uh, up here, I've got the regions uh, spec'd out around each sound effect. Um, and then they all get listed off to the right here in the region list. And when, I, when you click on them, you hear it, right? Nice and simple. But it's really convenient that I, I can hear how each of these things uh, sound and how they relate to each other. And if I need to tweak one, I can just work on it right here without having to switch to a different file. And... So this particular one here, this one is for when you go into the store in the game. And uh, so I'm going to, I just do an example here of how, what it's like to kind of work in this environment. So in this case, I'm going to decide, I've decided to add another uh, sound to it. So I just go down to the, uh, the, the folder track that's containing everything here. And in this case, uh, I'm going to um, uh, add a new track over here. Uh, now, now, now what I'm doing is I'm going into the Media Explorer, which uh, it conveniently lists all of my sound effects, uh, my whole library, and it's all completely searchable. So what I'm doing now over here in this, in this filter over here is I'm typing in, uh, what did I type in? Gun M16, because of course, what else are you going to type in there? <laughs> and um, so what this is going to do is when I click uh, on the the WAV file, it shows me all the sounds. This is a multi-take file, for example. And so for whatever reason, uh, I'm choosing this uh, particular one. And I can just drag that up onto this new track that I've made it, uh, and, and now we can hear uh, what that's going to sound like going into the shop. All right. Must be in the States. Um, <laughs> <coughs> that was a bit harsh. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so if um, if you uh, now what I've done is I've highlighted the region in the region list. I've set the output bus to master mix, and um, it's going to a directory that's pre-configured, but it's going to name it after the name of the region. And what I like about this is that I've only had to type in the name of this sound effect once, and any time I make a tweak to it, I just add the media or do the tweaks that I'm doing, and then. I, I highlight the region and hit uh, render, and it, I don't have to type the name in again, and it's just very automated. Um, and so, yeah, this is it rendering out to a WAV file. And there you go. Um, so, of course, this works across multiple uh, regions. So, uh, if, if let's say, for example, I needed to reduce all the volume of all the stings by 2 dB, I could just quite simply turn down the master bus volume, highlight... Uh, a bunch of regions uh, like this and just render them out and they're all going to get saved and rendered out to the same place really quickly. Again, I didn't have to type anything, which is just really convenient. Um, I find this process just works really well for me. I use it for it stings or UI sounds and, uh, and it just really enables me to be able to work on a lot of sounds at once, all in one place and make sure that they're all kind of cohesive with, with each other. Cool. Yeah. And and you so um so you're doing all this in Reaper, 
and you've yeah. really set it up so it's all automated. You keep saying you've, like you've automated yeah. the topping and tailing. So yes. I'm doing it manually like a chump. And, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, actually, I, I should have mm. pointed this out. Actually, I could mm. just show just one uh, one little uh, useful trick here. Is uh, yeah, I'll just pause that. Is you can see right at the top the green uh, line. That's the automation on the master bus, and so basically I'm manually fading out each sound effect so that I know that I'm going down to a nice zero point at the end. And all the sounds already have a quick quick fade at the beginning, so I know there's no weird clicking, uh, you know, uh, bad edit points because it's mm. all just pre baked like that too. Mm. And, yeah. and all this might seem a little bit intimidating. But uh, you assure me that it's actually not so hard to set. Oh, it's not so hard because I mean, yeah, that, that file looks really dense with information, and it, it is. But um, but you got to remember when I started on that, it was just blank, and I just start with one sound, and you just, you know, you kind of build it this way, and you build it this way, and it just slowly gets bigger and bigger, obviously. Um, and you know, color code things to help you find stuff. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it works really well for me. Cool. Well. Um, I'd really like to hear about some implementation stuff now, because okay. that's uh, something we're both very passionate about, is making the sounds really come to life in the game and behave the way that we feel they should behave in the game mm -hmm. and, yep. and sort of sell that illusion. Um, so, Jeff, you told me about a cool ambient system that you set up for Rome Total War. Yep. Uh, would you like to tell us about how that worked? Yeah, sure. So, um, worked on a game back in 2003, Rome Total War, and um, I wanted uh, quadraphonic... Um, weather sounds, basically, because uh, it could rain around you in the game. And so, um, basically, what I did is I put, uh, quite simply, four emitters around the listener. The headphones are the listener in this case. And uh, I made this uh, very expensive animation to demonstrate how this worked. There we go. Uh, so... <laughs> Blew half a uh, budget on that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, basically, the issue here, it sounded quad, and as, as you turned around, yeah, there was, you could hear the rain. But it didn't sound right. There was something not quite right. It was quad, and that was cool. But uh, and each each rain sound was slightly different, so it was you know you didn't get any weird phasing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But what I realized is uh, uh, what I should have done is uh, locked the orientation of the the rain samples to the world. And just to demonstrate that, here's an equally expensive animation. Like and the other half of that yeah, there it is. So basically, they stay locked in place while the listener rotates. And what this ends up doing is it causes the rain sounds to actually move when you move your, your head in the game or when you move the, the, the mouse. And it went from sounding pretty good to like, wow, I felt like I was actually there. And it was such a simple little implementation trick hmm. uh, that um, is obviously very useful for VR stuff and all that and yeah. that sort of thing. Hmm. But um, uh, but we did this way back then, and um, yeah, it's a simple trick, but uh, very effective. Well, the kind of attention to detail that really, really does get sells that immersive thing. I don't know, like yeah, immersion yeah. so overused, mm. but like yeah, with this sort of thing, yeah, it just felt yeah, really good. All around it, and then, <laughs> and the other thing is, uh, we have these uh, in that game. We had rivers, uh, and uh, so you could be when you were far away from the river. The river was represented by a single point source, just mono. As you came up to it, you all of a sudden these. Well, it would not all of a sudden, but it would merge into these four point sources, and you'd have the sound of the river all around you because you were floating above this river, because you can do that in games. And um, yeah, and it was just really effective. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, now, Xander, you mentioned you've got some cool tips for testing mm. your implementation. Well, cool for a certain value of cool. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, so I. Do you, do you ever have that situation where you're like uh, you're tweaking a really subtle effect? There's there's something, and you just you really want to get the finesse of it just right, and you're playing it over and over again, and you're like, oh, I think that's just a little bit better, and, it, and then you realize you had the thing bypassed the whole time. And, I've done that. And then, uh, <laughs> well, never again, because uh, whenever I'm testing something in in game that needs uh, an implementation and it's doing a subtle effect or, or something like this, and I I just can't quite tell, you know, these sorts of th things takes a lot of time to go through hmm. and, and try to, you know, massage these things and make them sound good. So I actually build purpose-made assets for specifically for testing these things. Right. So, so one example here is um, if you've got um, ambient occlusion in your game, ambient? Just occlusion. Occlusion in your game. Um, then, for example, I made a, a, a wave file. It's just a loop, and it's a stack of sine waves going up in, in overtones. And so I can hear precisely, uh, by the, this is sound awful by the way, so. Can you hear the 
bottom end kick in at the bottom, or uh, when you're up close, but the bottom end goes away as we pull away. Mm. Mm. So yeah, so we made this like very simple. Uh, there's no distance attenuation on that, so the fall off doesn't happen. It's just to a high pass and a low pass uh, going in and out. But um, <clears throat> because you've got this sound that's all overtones and distinct tones, you can hear when they come in and how it's working. So I had a situation with an occlusion system, and I couldn't peek under the hood. Uh, it, was, it was opaque to me. I, I didn't know how it was working. So make this, pop it in, and then you can tell whether you're getting like a wet-dry mix blend happening or whether they're actually sliding up a filter. And in this one, you can hear they're sliding up a filter with a low Q, and it's smoothly bringing in those frequencies as it goes up, mm. which might be harder to tell with an actual in-game sound, yeah. especially one that didn't have bottom end or didn't have a lot of really high frequencies. And what about uh, mm. reverbs and stuff? So when I'm, when I'm making designing a reverb for uh, an area in a game, I, uh, I chuck in a bunch of these different sounds which hopefully represent most of the types of sounds you can hear in the game. And that lets me get a really quick overview of how this reverb actually sounds. Um, so we'll just fly around in this video and see some different sounds and see how they affect the reverb. So that's a burst of white noise. R2-D2. <laughs> can hear a bit more of how it's reacting with the reverb. Pink noise now. Footsteps. And of course a clap. But there's so much more you can tell from each of these sounds interacting with the reverb that you, that's information you don't get from just the other sounds. Even though mm. white noise is, you know, like everything, mm. it's still gives you a really quick impression of, okay, how's this reverb gonna sound? Tested on all these sounds, when I'm happy, I then just you know, export those settings into the reverb in the game. And it's made it so much faster. Um, That's really cool. So yeah. I mean, the, the sounds themselves are fairly, they're not the nicest sounding sounds, but they're, you're building these custom sounds to help with imp testing your implementation. Mm. All right, so I think that's the end of our uh, talk. And so if anybody has any questions or would like us to clarify anything, uh, now's the time to ask. Yes. Oh, I see what you mean. Um, well, I guess, uh, I mean, like, um, as far as what I've been given to work with, I've received, you know, complete white box demos, if that's sort of what you mean, like something really rough versus uh, working on something that's more polished. Is, is that sort of what you mean? Well, I mean, like, when you're working with, um, say, engine, right? yep. um, like, do you, do you come up with, like, a, a modified kind of riff? Sure. Say, this is what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely will we'll, uh, provide a, a rough version. Um, it just turned out, like in the example that I gave of with, with Submerged there, that my, it was, my rough was like what, exactly what they wanted. Uh, it hasn't always been the case. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? it, it, it's really good to get a, a sound person on earlier if you can. Mm -hmm. Like as early as you have all of your concept art and game design documents sort mm -hmm. of ready, mm -hmm. that can actually be early enough that you can be talking to sound people. Mm. Uh, because, yeah, we can iterate on things and bring more value to the game with more steeping time to think about it. Um, but yeah, iteration yeah. definitely does yeah, happen sure. if we get given the time to do it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, mm. Any Anyone good? else? Anybody else? Yes? Yeah, I just wanted to ask um, you in particular, Jack, what, what's your favorite sound or compression library? Uh, for, for composing? Mm. Um, well, for strings, I quite like the uh, the LA scoring strings. Um, Lass is what they're called. Yeah, so that's just the string section. For brass and, and woodwinds, I was using the um, East West. Uh, what was it the um, Symphonic Orchestra mm. East West one? Uh, but I was talking with Kevin, uh, and he and I was actually Kevin mentioned the he uses the Cine brass from Cine samples. Uh, and I gave them a quick listen. It's like, yeah, that, that actually sounds pretty nice. So I'm kind of interested in getting those now. Yeah. Well, anyone else? Uh, yes? Uh, just a 
you have the, the quadrifying placement of the Amigas. Yes. Um, was that game the but third person, first person? That was um, third person. Third. Yeah, but you could move the camera all the way up into the sky or about six meters off the ground. Oh. And, and yeah, we made it so that and when you're in the sky, if it was raining, you didn't really hear the rain. You heard it when you went down low because the rain is hitting the ground, and that's where you hear it, yeah. So did you place the listener right on the camera? Um, that was a particularly tricky game for that. It was, uh, in fact, I think what we did is we scaled the, the listener movement. Uh, based, so it was attached to the camera, but there was an offset, and I think it even had like a different curve purely because it was unrealistic the way the camera could move. You could be really far out and look at this huge battle scene, right? And, but then also you could come right down above them and, and getting the, uh, the min-max distance and the curves back then was really tricky. We used, and we were using this sound system called Miles and uh, it, it was pretty crude actually. So <laughs> um, yeah, we had to do all sorts of weird trickery to make that sound right. Yeah. yeah. Yes? Yeah, you probably have. So you mean work on the project? Um, so like, if you work in any mini project in the mm -hmm. same scene as the developers? Oh, developing. yeah, absolutely. I definitely prefer to do that because um, I want to be hands-on with implementation. Um, I, I think, I mean, uh, if if we want middleware, giving us access to middleware is actually Why? often a, a, <laughs> a it's a time a big time-saving thing because uh, if we don't have that, we really need a lot of programmer hours. Uh, to help make tools and other things, especially if if we want to do something really interesting and new and different uh, with the implementation in the game, it just sucks so many hours trying to do this. Especially if you're working with the programmers who aren't experienced with um, audio work. Mm. And so a lot of time it's reinventing the wheel, right? So, mm. and what we're talking about is like mm. it's nice when we get to use FMOD or or WYS. Mm. Uh, much prefer it. Just gives us m much more power much more creativity and eases the burden on the, on the coding team. Yeah, so actually like, if we went back to that uh, spreadsheet, you'd see there was a, a column in that one for like parameters we wanted hooked up. And um, uh, I stole that from Jeff's one actually. Mm. <laughs> but because you had an FMOD um, project hooked up to it and you could just put in your asset list, you're like, oh, I need you know, the X position of this and the Y position of that and all the other things. Yeah. And then the developer can put the hooks in and then he it's up to the rest it's of a, yeah. It's up to me what what those parameters drove, and I could mm -hmm. experiment until it sounded the way I wanted it to sound, without yeah. without taxing the the audio coder or or the, uh, the team basically. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess giving us access to tools is probably the most um, powerful thing. You tools can do to and the, and the build itself, you mm -hmm. know. So yeah, for sure. Yes. I, I think you technically don't master sound effects or something. I mean, I don't. That might just be a, a, a nomenclature distinction or something. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I kind of do. Well, I mean, I've got a mastering chain on my uh, sound effects, uh, as as we were showing before, um, and that's really more like I guess that's a bit more like a bus um, processing. So like I, I might not necessarily consider that mastering. I don't always have the same chain on there. Um, but I do like to, you know, take all the elements, blend them in, and then process them all as one. Yeah. It helps really sort glue of, them. You're sort of mastering it. It's sort yeah. of just light mastering, say. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And I, and I yeah. do bring the levels up. Yeah, I do yeah. limiting yeah. and stuff because, yeah. you know, if you've got a sound that's not actually reaching, uh, you know, it's it's uh, full amplitude, or if it's got you know huge dynamics, there's only so much you can do turning it up in engine. You really can't push it sound louder than its max volume. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I do have to do, I guess, yes, yeah, some mastering to, mm -hmm. to make that happen. But with music, it's, it's, it's a dark art. Mm, it <laughs> is. Uh, I know for, for mm. myself with, with music, um, mm. I tend to master the version that goes into the game myself. Um, and my mastering chain is uh, typically um, the Waves Lin MB, which is their uh, linear multiband. I tend to use that because uh, it just feels like a, a bit of a safety net that I'm not going to uh, make a song that has too much bottom end. It seems to kind of rescue me. <laughs> um, and then I have a uh, instance of the Fab Filter uh, L2, which is the, the limiter. Uh, Pro L. Uh, sorry? Pro L. Pro L, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and that is where uh, I get my, my luffs, 
my LUFS level for my music and uh, um, and I'll decide like okay like hey Hand of Fate was minus 18 luffs across the board um, mm -hmm. and I'll do that to that level of mastering and that's for me good enough for the game itself uh, but then when I go to release a soundtrack of a game that I worked on I actually go back to the raw unmastered versions of the songs and I actually send that to a mastering guy that I know in Brisbane uh, named Dave Neal. He's my mastering guy and uh, he's really good. Mm. Yeah, mastering is a, a funny one. Like there are yeah. people who can really do it mm. and everyone else kind of can't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you can do that and like master, mix and master your own music, then yeah. power to you. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just, it's a really, it's yeah. a tricky thing and an easy thing to make it feel flat yeah. if you master wrong. Yep. But yeah, similar to Jeff, I use, uh, I use um, Isotope Ozone for my, uh, on my mastering chain for music because that's got like a yeah. multi-band and yeah. a limiter and, and other things on it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Anybody else? Yes. Um, do you have any advice for someone starting out building their BSD library particularly on budget? Advice for budget library? Um, well, look, uh, I suppose uh, Sounds Online or East West, they've got that one that you can subscribe to rather than buying. It's the mm. Composer Cloud, uh, which gives you access to the whole, their whole library. Mm. So you don't have to spend like a couple grand all up front. Um, now I don't know if you get locked into it. I, I you know I don't really know what the, uh, the the specific deal is, but it did seem like a, a nice low barrier to entry to access uh, a whole whack, like basically the whole orchestra pretty quickly and mm. cheaply. Like I I think it's like yeah. fifty bucks a month or something like that to to get yeah, the whole orchestra. Something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Twenty five. Twenty five. Oh, okay. Even better. Cool. <laughs> Um, yeah, that one's good, but I mean, I guess also you don't accrue, you know, it doesn't help you build your um, library of, of No, you kind of step in to have it all, yeah. but you, mm. it does lock you into that, so. Yeah. Um, there are a number of free ones you can get started with. Like, there are no, there's basically no free, good, like, realistic virtual, virtual instruments. You're just not going to get that. But there's some really interesting soft synths, some, like, obviously fake, but stylistically so instruments and stuff. Um, that's, a, that's all the stuff I started with. Mm. And then I think I bought things like the Native Instruments Complete Bundle when that was on a big, um, uh, on a really steep discount. Mm. Um, and that, that really helped. Mm. Um, Typically they put that on discount just before they release the next version. Mm. So, yeah. Was that? Okay. All right. So we're still um, going. Cool, yeah. <laughs> um, right, so any more questions? Yes. Have you ever worked on anything where you have a budget for live musicians? Yes. It's awesome. It's so nice, right? Oh. Um, so for me, it was, um, um, well, actually, I did on Hand of Fate 2. I uh, hired my friend Sean to play the, uh, like, the lute and mandolin and um, dulcimer and all nice, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, guitar player, but that was very sort of small scale. The largest scale I thing I've done is I hired this uh, Japanese percussion group called Tai Cause, and they were based in Sydney. And uh, they were this awesome Japanese, uh, well, they're not Japanese, a bunch of Aussies, but uh, they were playing uh, taiko drums, and I hired them and used them, uh, recorded them at Studio 301 in mm -hmm. Sydney uh, and had a nice budget for that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, on Alien Isolation, we had a massive budget, and we hired, like, the, uh, the local symphony, and it was just, yeah, it was awesome. We recorded at the studio called Air, and... Really, really nice. So, yeah, budget, big budgets are nice. Uh, that's definitely a plus of working on AAA. That's the only bit I miss about it. <laughs> yeah. uh, my, my only experience for, in terms of games of doing uh, live recording, because I, I majored in, in music recording at uni, so that was sort of my foundation that I built learning sound design stuff out of. Um, but when I was studying, I was able to have access to recording studios and things. So I, I do have a couple of games with live musicians on it because mm. I had some good friends and, uh, mm. <laughs> and free studio yeah. access. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a huge difference for <laughs> sure. Yeah. But yeah, generally now in negotiations with small developers, they want to divert that money elsewhere. Mm. Um, even if it's still in the audio budget, um, mm. you know. One thing I actually, just to riff on that a little bit, mm. is uh, when I was at... Uh, some of us were at high score. Anybody here go to high score? Yeah? It was pretty good, right? Um, uh, there was these guys talking about grants and, and um, so it's like from the government, like Victorian government. And I'm pretty sure this might, could possibly exist in Queensland as well. I'm not, not totally sure. But the point was is that uh, they said that there was grants for getting your, game, your music for a game 
uh, mastered. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you could get a grant to help pay for some musicians if the developer can't come up with the funds, mm. that you might actually get some money from a grant that might actually help up the quality of what, what you're working on. So I think that's probably worth looking into. Mm. You uh, could also, um, potentially, like if you're doing crowdfunding, have that as a stretch goal or something mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah. And that means, you know, if that money becomes available, you've got that budget mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Mm. For sure. Mm. Anyone else? We could. All right. I guess we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> oh, um. We'll just say a quick thank you to um, Tony and Izzy here at GCAP for having us down here. Uh, and I'd really like to thank Screen Queensland for the support. Uh, and we'd, we'd like to encourage you to join your local game audio uh, community if you have one. Uh, in Brisbane, I help run the Game Audio Brisbane group. Um, there's also a national Game Audio Discord. Just ask someone for an invite. It's, it's not uh, exclusive, it's just not listed. So um, we're both, you can uh, ask either of us for an invite or any number of people. Uh, if you're in Melbourne, you can join the Anzac group. And uh, if there's not one in your town, why don't you start one? Mm. Because even if there's only a few of you, I'm sure you can get together and share your skills. And it's, it's been hugely beneficial for us in, uh, in Brisbane, actually, and an enriching experience. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and if you want help setting up one, then we've probably got some lessons yeah. <laughs> about yeah. that as well. And just remember, again, we're here all week, so come up to us and say hello and ask us anything. We're happy mm -hmm. to talk about it. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs>